Hello, I'm Mark Crutcher, president of Life Dynamics in Denton, Texas, and I want to welcome you to Life Talk for March 2002. Father Frank Pavone is with us today to bring you up to date about what's happening at Priest for Life. Also joining us is Reverend Sonny Foraker of Pastors for Life, and he and Father Frank have an exciting announcement for you. Then we're going to introduce you to some very special people who head up three of America's pro-life youth groups, and one of them will be telling you about some very interesting things that went on at the Winter Olympics. All that and a whole lot more is coming up on today's show. But first, we've got Alan Ackles with this month's Life Talk News. Alan? All right, Mark, thank you very much. The Alan Goodmacher Institute, a pro-abortion research organization associated with Planned Parenthood, has released new statistics which show that four out of ten unintended pregnancies end in abortion. The study states that the most common reasons for these abortions include inadequate finances, parents not wanting to change their lifestyle, and parents simply not feeling that they were ready to have children. The study also found that 81 percent of children murdered by abortion were conceived outside of marriage. While appearing on an MTV special, Secretary of State Colin Powell said society should ignore social conservatives and rely more on the use of condoms. Well, this drew broad criticism from conservative and pro-life groups who publicly asked President Bush to rein in Mr. Powell. Dr. James Dobson, president of Focus on the Family, took Powell to task saying, Secretary Powell's comments directly contradict those of his boss, President Bush, who just proposed a $33 million increase in funding for abstinence-only education in the United States. Over the next few days, Powell tried to backpedal, saying that he was talking about people who were already sexually active. He also claimed that he has advocated abstinence education for years. In western New York State, 20-year-old Jeremy Powell killed his unborn baby by beating, kicking, and punching his three-month pregnant girlfriend. The mother, also 20, says Powell beat her because she refused to have an abortion. She told police that during the attack, he told her, I'm going to beat that baby out of you. Bail was set at $80,000, and Powell currently remains incarcerated. Pro-lifers across the country were encouraged when Health and Human Services Secretary Tommy Thompson announced a new wording in a health care regulation calling an unborn baby a child rather than a fetus. Pro-abortion groups reacted strongly and universally condemned the Bush administration for this announcement. Now it appears that Secretary Thompson may have had a change of heart. The actual wording that had pro-lifers so excited has yet to appear in the Federal Registry, even though the accepted time to have completed the process has expired. When Thompson went before the House Ways and Means Committee, he said that the wording was not final yet and that he would seek to, quote, mitigate the harshness of the rhetoric, unquote. Colleen Perot of the Republican National Coalition for Life released a statement challenging Thompson, asking if he thought calling babies in the womb unborn children was really harsh rhetoric. In New York, the number of pro-life centers subpoenaed by pro-abortion attorney general Elliot Spitzer has grown to 24. Attorneys from the American Center for Law and Justice have now filed a motion to stop the subpoenas. Meanwhile, another elected official, Nassau County District Attorney Dennis Dillon, has openly criticized Spitzer, calling his campaign, quote, heavy-handed harassment, unquote. Spitzer responded, calling it curious that Dillon would use his office and title to express personal views. Ironically, this campaign appears to have grown out of a promise Spitzer made to his pro-abortion contributors. Life Dynamics has acquired a letter on official New York State letterhead thanking the Westchester Coalition for Legal Abortions for their help in confronting the pro-life centers. And in a related development, Life Dynamics has also learned that in 2001, this same pro-abortion group settled a claim dealing with political contribution irregularities by paying a fine to the Federal Elections Commission. Well, the White House has pushed aside the advice of conservative party members and given Louis Eisenberg the position of national finance chairman of the Republican Party. Eisenberg, a former Democrat, was the money man behind the election of radical pro-abortion Republican Christine Todd Whitman as governor of New Jersey. He also founded and financed the, the Committee for Responsible Government, a group that raises and spends money to defeat pro-life Republicans. Life Dynamics President Mark Crutcher says that Eisenberg's newfound influence on the party's high-dollar donors is a clear signal that there will be little or no support from the party for pro-life Republicans who challenge pro-abortion Republicans in a primary race. Meanwhile, United Press International is reporting that Republican Party operatives in Washington are hinting that Eisenberg is just the first of several high-profile pro-abortion appointments expected in the future. 
In Hollywood, California, police raided the death camp of abortionist Edgar Rudolfo Ruiz and found extremely unsanitary conditions plus a variety of illegal drugs. They also seized 17 containers of aborted children, arrested Ruiz, and put him in jail with a $1 million bail. However, before investigators were able to examine the hundreds of patient records confiscated from the clinic, the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office released Ruiz without bail and declined to file charges. Police investigators say that they are concerned that Ruiz will either flee the country or move to another state and start doing abortions again. The American Civil Liberties Union has targeted 618 Catholic hospitals nationwide claiming that if they receive public money, they should be forced to provide abortions, birth control, sterilization, and the morning after pill. Lorraine Kenny, public education coordinator for the ACLU's Reproductive Freedom Project, told Life Talk that Catholic-run hospitals should not be allowed to avoid these services simply because individual employees may refuse to participate on religious grounds. She says that conscience clauses that protect health care workers should not be applied to entire hospitals. And finally, a group of Connecticut pro-lifers were awarded $30,000 from the city of Bridgeport, plus an undisclosed amount from the Summit Women's Abortion Mill. For 12 years, local pro-lifers had sidewalk counseled in front of the death camp and had seen over 1,000 babies saved because of their work. In May of last year, Bridgeport police began demanding that pro-lifers stay 10 feet from anyone entering the abortion mill and 28 feet from the property. The city justified their crackdown by using the city's loitering laws and by misapplying a 1997 injunction meant only to apply to one particular pro-lifer. American Family Association attorney Michael DePrimo filed suit for the pro-lifers in federal court. He told Life Talk that, quote, the city conceded that the injunction used against the pro-lifers did not apply. We were very pleased, unquote. And that is Life Talk News for this month. Mark, it's back to you. Thanks, Alan. Y'all welcome back. Uh, Mona's joining me today to help bring you some additional information. Welcome, Mona. Thanks. How are you? Fine. Um, you may recall that we held off on delivering the George Bush petitions that all you guys signed because of the September 11th uh, terrorist attacks. We didn't think that was a good time to deliver them. Well, with this new um, campaign that the Bush administration is doing of allowing states to classify the fetus as a, as a child, we thought, well, this would be a good time now to deliver those petitions. After all, if the child is a, is a living, if the fetus is a living human being and a child, then they need to do the things that we're asking for in this petition. So the petitions were delivered to the White House. Um, and the final count was a little over 125,000, and we'll just kind of have to wait and see what happens with that. Um, also, I want to let you up, uh, bring you up to date on something else that's happening. You may have learned or may have heard that um, the new mayor of New York has announced that he's going to require that all New York hospitals teach abortion training. Um, this is really important. The statistics are that about one doctor in seven at some point rotates through a New York hospital or trains in a New York hospital, so this is a major issue. We just recently completed a mailing to half the doctors in the state of New York um, trying to discourage this, this project, and um, we've already, they just dropped a couple of days ago, and we've already started getting some um, responses, so they are going to have an effect on this deal. Um, we're just continuing to inform the medical community about the stigma that's attached and let them know that they do not have to do this. Just because the abortion training is offered does not mean that you have to take it. And that's an important issue because I've had a lot of people contact me lately saying, you know, I keep on hearing you say that we're winning this battle because fewer and fewer people are, are doing abortions. But I hear this rhetoric out here in the public that more hospitals are actually offering the training than ever before. That's true, but that doesn't mean more people are taking it. We've heard reports of a lot of these um, medical training facilities that are offering abortion training with no students. So that's a good, good deal, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. Right. The Centers for Disease Control are the people that are supposed to keep the abortion statistics for the nation, and um, they got some bad news recently from good. the government. Um, mm -hmm. They found out that their budget for this year will be slashed by $170 million. That's great. Very pro-abortion group, and uh, yeah. that's very good news for and us. The, yeah, and people need to understand how important the CDC is. Uh, the CDC in the abortion battle is probably, in my view, more important than even the Supreme Court. 
and um, we need to do another segment on that. We've talked about that on, on past Life Talks. We need to do another one on that so people understand, A, how radically pro-abortion the CDC is and why they are, uh -huh. and how important that is to the battle over abortion. Right. Um, you also had something um, in a Psychology Today that I found very interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, Psychology Today came out with a report. It's called, Can Prayer Get You Pregnant? And it was very interesting because there were two separate studies that showed the positive power of prayer and they almost didn't, they, well, they almost didn't. Uh, uh, Report it, yeah. yeah, they almost didn't tell anybody about it because they couldn't explain it. The first one uh, dealt with women who were go undergoing fertility treatments, um, could not have children. And um, what they found is that the, the physician didn't know that somebody was praying for them, and the woman that was trying to get pregnant didn't know somebody was praying for them, but somebody was. And the women who were prayed for and the doctors who were prayed for, they got pregnant twice as often as the women who were not being prayed for. Wow, imagine that. <laughs> and so the Columbia uh, Department of OBGYN was trying to decide what do we do with that because they tried to, to take any everything that would make this you know, confound this and make it happen, and they couldn't find anything. They were looking for a man-made excuse right. for why this would happen. Well, the, neither the doctor nor the woman knew they were being prayed for, so they said, well, you know, whatever, so we'll, we'll just publish it. Yeah. And then the second one was um, they only looked at uh, Jewish people or Christians, and what they found is uh, Jews and Christians that attend church services regularly not only live longer, they don't die of the same causes that other people die from. Right. They don't die of the heart disease, the digestive problems, all that. And they were like, well, it's probably because when you go to church, you know, it's a de-stressor and they don't have right. the stress in their lives <laughs> and stuff. I mean, radical thought, maybe there is a God. Right. I don't know. Right. Maybe, and he, and he maybe, listens to prayer. Yeah, and, and he answers prayer. Right. Radical thought, that's, I know. That's very, but, but the amazing thing was that they admitted that they started not to report on this because they couldn't explain it. Right. That's the that's the most astonishing part of the whole thing. Um, also, you had something on the baby take it over, uh, baby think it over. Right. Um, we talked about that last month right. on last month's notebook, and um, that is the Martin County in Florida. That is their their teen pregnancy program, and it's where they take the baby home with them, and it cries and needs to be fed and all that. Um, well, the the lady that the was goal, helping. Let's make sure they understand. The goal of this, ostensibly, is to is to make teenagers not get uh, want to have a baby. Well, and that's exactly what the goal <laughs> that is. That's what the goal is. Well, what we talked about last month is it's called teen pregnancy, but it really has very little to do that with that. All it has to do with is not making these girls realize they don't want to have children right. as teenagers. And I'm just going to read. They had to do some extra credit work in this class last semester, and I'm going to read a couple of excerpts. One girl says, "I realize what a burden a child is." The next girl says, "I already knew I didn't want to have a child as a teen. I just hope nev I never have to go through this again." I had no idea the amount of time you had to give up and how much having one can change your life. I'm not having a baby till I'm 30. And this other girl says, it's almost as if you have a 50 pound ball and chain attached to your right. leg. And it just goes on and on. These are all uh, actual letters that the, the, the kids The important wrote. thing here is, they're not telling these girls don't get pregnant. They're saying don't have a baby. Well, you know what? I looked through the entire thing and they never even talked about not having sex. Right. They never talked about, right. I mean, even if you want to look at it the liberal way, Contraception. That's never even mentioned. Right. It's just don't have a don't baby. Don't have the baby. Well, right. the only other option then you've left them open with right. is, a, is, a do, is abortion. Is abortion. Right. Exactly. That's that's um, astonishing. Um, I want to bring you up to date some, uh, something else you may have been seeing in the news too and, and you may not understand uh, or have not thought about the implications for the pro-life movement. Um, there is this battle going on in Washington D.C. over campaign finance reform and on the surface, it seems like a good on a, a good thing. Um, fortunately, the National Right to Life Committee is, is has joined the battle in opposition to campaign finance reform, and they appear to be doing a very um, good job of uh, informing people and letting people know what the dangers are of this for the for the pro life community. Basically, they're going to try to stop uh, what they call advocacy advocacy groups like National Right to Life or Life Dynamics or American Life League or whoever focus on the family from being able to influence uh, elections. And it's an outrageous attempt to, to do away with the, um, the First Amendment to the Constitution. And the thing that makes me so angry about it, Mona, is if, if you boil it down, what the uh, people who propose this, the, the Senate, uh, particularly John McCain, what they're saying is, because we're a bunch of crooks, we're going to take away your First Amendment rights. I mean, that, that's it in a nutshell. Right. And I'm not sure I understand why it is that we as Americans have to surrender our First Amendment rights because they're a bunch of crooks. You know, if they're serious about uh, taking out the influence of money in politics, it's very simple. You simply say, we're going to make a, a standard over here. 
that says money cannot be, in, if, if you're influenced, if a vote that you cast appears to have been influenced by a donation that you got, you go to jail for the rest of your life. <laughs> That'll end the problem, won't it? It sure will. <laughs> but see, they don't want to do that. Right. They want to take away from us the ability to try to influence um, elections and influence uh, legislation in Washington, D.C., and it's outrageous. And um, we don't always agree with the National Right to Life Committee on, on everything that they do, obviously, but uh, they're to be applauded for their battle against this. Yeah. I also want to bring up something else. Um, you know, back during the, the Clinton fiasco, which I guess included the whole eight years, but um, you kept on hearing all these people say, well, we're, morality is irrelevant. You know, we're not electing a pope and we're not electing priests and preachers to the presidency and that morality is really unimportant. What matters is, is our people efficient and so forth. You know, we got this big Enron thing going on right now. I don't care what anybody says. This is not a financial catastrophe. This is not a political catastrophe. This is not about campaign finance reform. This is about morality. Right. These people were thieves. Mm -hmm. and. That's what the, so don't sit here and tell me that morality doesn't matter in the, in the issue of public policy. Morality matters in everything. And so if, if people want to continue saying that, then tell me, explain to me Enron and things like that. These are all moral issues. Sure. And sure. Uh, oh, also, I wanted, you had something neat on the Tops thing that we talked about last right. month. Right. Tops was the friendly markets in New York. And we talked about that last month. And they had the coupons for Planned Parenthood on the back of right. the register tickets. Well, one of our uh, viewers who did a very good job, she talked to her local store in Niagara Falls and said, you know, what's the deal with this? And the, the manager says, oh, my goodness, I didn't know that. And so he gave her the headquarters number. And so she calls headquarters and talks to their customer service. And they say, you know, we've gotten quite a few complaints. We're going to go ahead and we'll, we won't run any more register tapes with it. But we're going to let the register tapes that are in there run out. Right. And, and then, we'll, then we won't we run anymore. We can't go and take all those no, out. No, we won't take those out. Right. Well, she made a good point. She, she wrote a letter to the CEO of Topps Friendly Market and said, you know, what if you had misprinted the, the register tape and it had said instead of getting $1 free groceries, you get $1,000 free. Those things would have been pulled in a heartbeat. I mean, right. they would have been right. gone in a second. Right. And she was just demanding that if, yeah. if you really think that this is something wrong, you need to get it out. That's right. That, that was a good it point was, that she a, made. An awesome point. And right. I have another one. And um, from last month, we talked about Chris Slattery. Right. Um, he was a guest last month, and he was talking about the New York CPCs getting in trouble for um, having unprofessional people. Well, Spitzer, um, is the, the attorney, attorney general, general there, is on this on this program after them. I mean, it's, it's just it's just harassment right. is all it is. Sure, right. but he's trying to say that you know you don't have licensed and right. you have unprofessional people working in there, and, right. they're, and they're giving pregnancy tests and all that. Well, another one of our viewers from Massachusetts sent us a, a copy of an ad for an abortion clinic in her state in Massachusetts. And this is a Planned Parenthood facility. It's called Tapestry Health. Yeah, but it's, and, they changed um, the name. Yep. Um, it's for a full-time office manager, right. and um, the funny part is, is the duties are um, answering phones, clerical work, doing billing, and the qualifications are good communication skills, computer skills, and strong organizational skills. But down at the bottom of duties, they have pregnancy testing and emergency contraception providing. Right. And it's like, well, then if you're going to say that yeah. CPCs can't have it, then why can the abortion And all they're clinic? saying is to do this, all you have to have is good communication skills. And, and good, good clerical skills and right. organizational skills. Right, right. It's, it's astonishing. Right. Um, I want to talk to you just for a moment. We're about out of time for this segment. This uh, new thing that the, the government has done with um, declaring the fetus a child, um, on the surface that seems like a real good thing. The, the problem with it is I think it has some real potential danger. If, if as a culture we can say that we agree in our law that the, un, that the fetus is a child, an unborn child, but we can still kill them by the millions, that in effect reinforces the, the abortion right. It says that we can go out here and, and agree that what we're doing is killing children, but so what? So we've got to be very careful when we hear things like that, just not to assume, that, oh, this is a great thing. Um, but the other thing that it does do, and, and this is something you've heard me talk about before, I think the quickest way that we can end abortion in America is if we had a governor of some state who was pro-life enough, committed to the cause enough, to stand up and cause a constitutional challenge. And this is a good example of how you could do that. If I were the governor of the state of Texas, for example, one of the things that I would say is, look, to the federal government, you have told me that the unborn child can be called, a, a, I mean, the fetus can be called an unborn child, that it is a living human being. Well, I'm going to act on that. And I'm going to instru instruct the Attorney General of the state of Texas to uh, arrest anyone who performs an abortion in this state under the auspices that this is a child and that our homicide laws apply. 
This would obviously create a federal showdown, a constitutional showdown with the federal government. And I don't know if the federal government would have the uh, guts it takes to come into a state and say, uh, go after the state government that already exists there. Um, maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. But at least we could, we could bring this thing to a boil and have some actual tangible results that we could look at. Um, and this thing could do that if we had a governor somewhere that had the courage to do it. Uh, Mona, thanks for helping me out today, and we'll look forward to probably having you back next month to help us out with this same segment. We'll be right back. I've discovered that I've become much more refined in my understanding of the issues by watching Life Talk. It's one of the best educational tools available for pro-life America. From Life Dynamics Incorporated in Denton, Texas, you're watching Life Talk. Last few months, we've been reporting on the continuing saga of Arizona abortionist Brian Finkel. You may recall that after he was arrested for sexually molesting nine of his patients, dozens of additional women came forward and told authorities that they too had been sexually attacked by Finkel. Recently, an Arizona judge reduced Finkel's bail and allowed him to leave jail. Then, after the number of women saying Finkel had assaulted them grew to more than 100, police filed additional charges and re-arrested him. This time, his bail was set at a much higher level but an Arizona court let him out again, this time without posting any additional bail. Some of the most damaging evidence against this notorious abortionist are the statements of several former employees who say they witnessed these sexual assaults. In a police interview, Finkel's response was to say that he has a gun and they don't, and that if they get in a fight with him, they're going to lose. What I want to know is, where is the national media on this story? And what about the National Organization for Women? Why are all these people so completely silent about the situation? What if some man known to be involved in the pro-life movement was accused of sexually assaulting more than 100 women? And what if he threatened people with a gun? Do you think these people would be looking the other way? Not a chance. Now would be rioting in the streets demanding a roundup of every pro-lifer in America. And for the next few weeks, this would be the lead story in every newscast and in every newspaper. Women being sexually assaulted by their abortionists is certainly not a rare occurrence. In fact, Mark wrote an entire chapter about it in his book, Lime 5. Neither is it rare for the secular media and these radical pro-abortion women's groups to cover it up. But the one thing they can't do is silence us. Life Dynamics has obtained some shocking behind-the-scenes information about this story. And on next month's Life Talk, we're going to be bringing it to you. In the meantime, I've got one thing to say to the National Organization for Women and to America's left-wing media. Remember this, the more you cover up for the abortion industry, the more you expose your own hypocrisy. I'm Zintra Tuttle for Life Talk. Check out Life Dynamics' new website at lifedynamics.net. Get inside secrets of the abortion industry, new tools and materials, and get connected through our new database with pro-life events and organizations in your area. LifeDynamics.net. It's one of the pro-life movement's greatest resources. Welcome back. I'm joined here by two of my very best friends, Father Frank Pavone. Hello, Frank. How are you? Good to be back. I'm well, thank you. Thank you. And Reverend Sonny Foraker. Sonny, Good to how be are here. You doing? Thank you. Great to be here. All right. And uh, Sonny is the... You started... Pastors for Life, didn't you? I was a co-founder and director for Pastors for Life in South Carolina, yes. And of course, as we know, Father Frank is somewhat tied to Priest for Life. You have kind of a <laughs> tenuous task there, some, I mean, yeah, a tenuous exactly. link there. Um, we're going to be getting back to you in a minute, Sonny, but first, we have a lot of people, um, Father Pavone, that are aware of the trials and tribulations that you've had over the last few months. And uh, we get a lot of calls saying, you know, what's happening, what's, what's going on. So we thought we'd have you on and just kind of give a really quick a synopsis of what's happening. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for keeping the viewers updated on my situation. Everything is just fine. Uh, the Cardinal ended up giving me an assignment to a small parish, which is right near our Preach for Life headquarters, first of all, right. which already has a pastor. I help him with, with masses, but it does not interfere with my pro-life work. I'm able to continue my work with Priest for Life and outside of Priest for Life as well. And we have never been stronger. We have never been more united. 
uh, things are just going great. Now, some of those people that you talked about sent me letters uh, which sounded like condolence letters. Oh, I'm so sorry for the pain that you've been going through. And I need to make one thing clear. My pain has been over the baby killing that's been taking place right. and the fact that the church is not doing what it takes to stop it. Right. That's the problem. And all through this whole ordeal, you know, people have been saying, uh, oh, well, you know, nobody's irreplaceable. It's never been an issue about my irreplaceability. It's always been an issue about my integrity. If abortion is taking place, we need to make it the top priority, personally and as a church, to stop the killing. Absolutely. So thank God, though, uh, as I say, our work continues, and uh, nothing for me uh, is, has changed. We're moving full speed ahead. Praise God for that. We, uh, you know, it was touch and go there. It looked like from just yes. looking from the outside, you know, when. And I was in a lot of communication with you about this time, and I know exactly. it was uh, in spite of the fact that uh, it all worked out well. There were some times there that, you know, as you know, you know it better than anybody that, that things didn't always look like they might and, work and out. And I've said to people, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm the director of Priests for Life or Street Sweepers for Life. The point right. is, you know, we're giving all our energy to, 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 to save these children. So a pleasure to work with people like you as well. Well, thank you. And we, we consider you one of our staunchest friends and, and allies in this battle, and we, we were happy to do what little we could do to keep people, you know, informed. And of course, we had a lot of our viewers that, that wrote some letters, and some of them they sent copies of to us, and I gave to you, that were not always the kindest. <laughs> you know, they were basically inviting uh, Cardinal Egan out onto the street corner, you know, to, to duke it out. But, you know, fortunately, nothing like that ever happened. Um, Sonny, I want to talk a little bit uh, with you. Uh, you are a Baptist preacher. Yes. You're of my stripe of this deal. <laughs> and uh, uh, you were the founder of Pastors for Life. Now, you've moved to Houston, but you started out uh, in was it South Carolina? South Carolina. Right. Um, yes. what, what was the motivation behind Pastors for Life? There was a uh, conviction in our heart. When I say our, there were several of our pastors getting together uh, of different denominations from Assembly of God, uh, Baptist, Church of God, um, individuals who sat down and had a, had a common... Um, hurt, pain over what was going on in our own backyard with three different abortion clinics in Greenville, South Carolina. And we sat down and prayed about it. We met regularly. And then finally, out of uh, six of us, decided we need to start what we believe is the way to accomplish the battle, to have victory in this, and that is to bring the church involved. And the only way you can mobilize the church is to have the pastors involved. So we founded in 1992 the Pastors for Life. And we began to have rallies, we began to have conferences, we began to bring pastors together from all denominations, um, our Catholic brothers and sisters, uh, everyone uh, became a part of it. And we focused on what would be our strategy. And, and the strategy was to be, to give pastoral leadership, to mobilize the church to get involved in uh, taking care of our local Jerusalem, our area, our, right. our town. And, uh, and, and that's how we founded it and it began. That's great. Um, and you're still involved, even though you've now moved to, to Houston. Right. Uh, now, there have been times when, when you've worked together. Have you not, both of you worked together uh, on Yes, in fact, I had the pleasure of being in South Carolina. One of my trips there, uh, we had, a, I believe, a pastor's luncheon gotcha. and uh, shared together, encouraged one another, and uh, right. it was... Some of our rallies, we would invite uh, various speakers to come in uh, to, to help rally the pastors, to bring them in as speakers, uh, and see what's happening throughout the nation, see what's going on there, and that would encourage and motivate, and we would use that as a kickoff, uh, as a rally, a rallying point for the pastors, to see that uh, we're not alone in this, that it's all across the, the nation and the world, and uh, this was a way to draw them together. You know, uh, regular viewers to Life Talk, and I know both of y'all watch Life Talk, um, have heard me say many times, and, and maybe this is too harsh, I have some people who have called and criticized saying that I don't believe the problem. I keep on hearing these people say, well, the, 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 the key to getting the church involved is education, and I don't believe that for a minute. Mm -hmm. my, my view is that the, the, what's lacking here is not knowledge but courage, mm -hmm. uh, that putting it bluntly, most of these people are just abject cowards. They know there's going to be a price to pay for standing up for the unborn child. They know they should do it, but they're not willing to pay the price for doing it. Mm -hmm. um, am I wrong on that? Is that... I think that's exactly the problem. You know, when I first uh, took over Priests for Life, the, uh, the logo on our stationery was about John the Baptist leaping in the womb. I changed it to Paul's words. The spirit God has given us is no cowardly spirit. 
That is precisely the problem. We need a renewal of courage, a renewal to realize that if we're going to proclaim the gospel, we have to be ready to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And uh, we're too many are just ones in the womb. Exactly. And there's, the, and there's a, so that the abortion issue is not something added on top of preaching the gospel. It's not something in competition with preaching the gospel. It is preaching the gospel. And uh, if we're silent about abortion, we're silent about the gospel. So right. it's courage. Right. What is your take on that, son? Well, absolutely. I, I find that, um, that we're not going to get all the pastors involved. There, many pastors uh, will have their certain turfism. They have certain agendas, and they don't get involved. And, and we're saying, well, like Gideon's army, we're going to take those who will have courage enough to take a stand at whatever level. One of the things we said in Pastors for Life, we will be cautious about um, having a, you must do what I'm doing. Come in at some level, and we trust that God's Spirit would bring them up to some other level where they would be courageous. We're looking for pastors who will crawl into the trench and handle that battle even when the enemy is about to overrun them. Um, many pastors won't even get in the trench. Right. And we're looking for those pastors who will take a stand. And God honored that. God made a difference because of a few. Right. And, and that's what we're looking for. You know, that's the thing I think people need to understand is that we don't have to get everybody. You're saying we're not going to be able to get everybody, and obviously you know you're not going to be able to get all the Catholic bishops and Catholic priests in the country to get involved. We don't have to get all of them. No, that's right. Right. We can do this with a very, a relatively small number of people if those people are committed. The issue is not, the, the, in, in, a, in a sense, it's not the quantity of people involved, it's the quality of their commitment to the cause. Change does not come about through committees. Right. Change does not come about through structures. Change comes about through courageous individuals that are willing to lay down their lives. Yeah. Well, we, and when I was in the auto industry, we used to have a, a definition of committees. A, a committee is a dark alley down which good ideas are taken to be quietly strangled. You know, and that's, that's really true. <laughs> that's true. And, and that's, that's, so yeah, you're right. We don't need massive organizations and big committees and, and uh, boards of directors that get together and decide what activity we take and so forth. What activity we don't take. That's the biggest problem with boards of directors is that's their goal. That's right. Is to keep you from taking activity that might be dangerous. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'll tell you right off the bat, there is no safe uh, way to do what we're trying to do. You're always exposed to some sort of risk. That's right. You calculate the risk and you minimize them, but you're always exposed to risk. Um, and and it, I, I'll make an analogy again here. Um, I, I spent a good, as you all know, a good part of my life racing motorcycles. Well, that's dangerous. And, but you minimize the risk. You do the things that are necessary to, to protect yourself, but you, you recognize when you go into it, if you're going to do this, there's going to be risk associated. And there's no, there's no safe way to fight abortion. And, you right. know, you covered on, on Life Talk previously the atta attacks we're enduring in New York on the crisis pregnancy centers. And, you know, one of the lessons, I think, in that whole story for the pro-life movement is you can't find a safe haven. I think some people have gone into crisis pregnancy work because they feel, I don't want to be involved in the legal battles, in the confrontations on the streets. Well, look now, you're involved in the battle now. Right. Hey, yeah, there's no right. way to escape it. We're, if right. we stand up, we're going to be attacked. That's right. Well, we've only got a few minutes left, but we want to make a very, what I think is a very exciting announcement. We're at, here at Life Dynamics and at Life Talk are real excited about this. You guys are joining the staff, it seems. At, uh, uh, on a rotating basis, we're starting a new segment called... Um, CIA, clergy in action, and these are the two guys that are mostly involved. When you talk about clergy in action, these are, these are, your, these are your people. Um, we're going to have a rotating segment called clergy in action, somewhat similar to the, to the soapbox in Pro-Life 101 that we do now. And uh, one month it'll be Father Pavone, and the next month it'll be Sonny, and the next month it'll be Father Pavone again, and we'll just keep on going back and forth. Uh, we actually are going to introduce that this month, and our first, first up is Father Pavone, so later in the show, the first edition of Clergy in Action will be coming up, and I've already seen your script. It's really, really good, and it goes to the heart of the thing that we're talking about here, mm -hmm. the, the need to get involved in action, and action is the key word here. That, that is, it's not just a matter of, oh, I think I'm pro-life, and, you know, that's good enough, and I tell people that it's wrong. That's not the issue. Mm -hmm. What people think is irrelevant. It's what they do exactly. that matters, exactly. and um, so, so I just want to say how excited we are here at Life Dynamics about this new alliance that you guys are uh, joining us in here to, to talk to the church and to talk to people who are in churches. And I think one of the strongest things that we're going to have with this CIA is speaking to the laity and to let them know that your pastor may be a coward and not doing anything, but there are other people out there that are and, um, and that there's a mandate to do in, for, for them to do those things. So um, again, we're real excited to have you guys. I, I
I'm really thankful to both of you for agreeing to do this. So, um, again, thank you. And um, we'll be looking for that segment later in the show. Okay. We will be right back. Within the discussions about genetic research, reproductive technology, cloning, stem cells, in vitro fertilization, and all the rest, we sometimes allow what appear to be unimportant secondary issues to slip by unnoticed. That is extremely dangerous because it is in these secondary issues that the fundamental moral problems routinely exist. For example, in the field of fertility treatment for women having trouble conceiving a child, you often hear the term selective reduction used. Generally, the doctors who offer these services or the researchers who develop them will casually throw out this term and then quickly move on as if it is of no consequence. Don't be deceived by this cavalier attitude. The fact is, selective reduction is just a fancy term for abortion. It is the process by which a woman who is carrying more than one unborn child can select which are allowed to live and which are allowed to be killed. Let me read a description of this procedure that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on April 21, 1988. Using ultrasound to locate each fetus, the doctors would insert a needle into the chest cavity of the most accessible fetus and place the needle tip into the heart of the baby. Potassium chloride was then injected into the heart and the heart was viewed on the ultrasound screen until it stopped beating. Even at nine weeks, three of the 12 fetuses selected for elimination presented problems. The heart continued to beat and the procedure had to be repeated. Of course, defenders of selective reduction are going to argue that they are usually performed on women who have taken fertility drugs and conceive more babies than they can physically deliver. They will argue that if a woman is pregnant with 10 or 11 unborn babies and tries to carry all of them to term, the chances of even one surviving is virtually zero. While they may be right, what they are overlooking and what they want the rest of us to overlook is that this situation was avoidable in the first place. While infertility can be a heartbreaking situation for the couple who desperately wants a child, that doesn't mean our society can justify doing absolutely anything it takes to give them a child. In this case, it is indefensible that we create 10 or 11 children knowing beforehand that 9 or 10 will have to be killed so that one can survive. Any way you look at it, that cure is worse than the disease. In the end, selective reduction is simply one more example of why medicine and science cannot be allowed to operate as if the morality of what they're doing is irrelevant. And when you are confronted with these kinds of issues, that's the point you have to drive home. I'm Cherie Driggs for Life Talk. Hi, this is Alan Keyes, and you're watching Life Talk. Welcome back. I am joined now by Brandy Swindell from Gen Life, or Generation Life, is that right? Generation Life, yes. Right. And um, you are the executive director of that, as, as I recall. Yes, I am. Well, we want to have a little, couple of segments here today from youth so that everybody in the world didn't get the idea that uh, everybody involved in the pro-life movement is a worn out old man like me. <laughs> um, you've been in the news a lot lately. Uh, you were at the Olympics, and uh, we saw you on things like O'Reilly Factor and some other um, well-known yes. shows. The well, New York Times. New York, made Times. It in the New York Times. Well, that's great. Life. Yes. Great. Tell us what was going on at the Olympics. Well, and why were you there? Well, <laughs> Generation Life uh, got the vision about two years ago uh, when we realized that the Olympics were going to be in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, that we needed to be there to be a witness for the preborn children and also to get out the chastity message. Uh, it was a perfect stage uh, for us to get that message out. So we've been working very hard. And uh, this Olympics, we had about 60 youth from all around the nation uh, join us for our event, which we were calling Celebrate the Children of the World. Uh, we had Rock for Life out there. So survivors, uh, teens for life, and it was phenomenal. Right. Now we got and two representatives of survivors and Rock for Life yes. that are going to be on the next segment. Yes, they're, they're which is, is so great that you're, you're taking time on your show uh, to showcase this generation rising up right. uh, in you know, the pro-life movement. We're seeing a lot of polling now that's showing that younger people are, are beginning to really take to the pro-life message, and um, yes. that's very heartening for us. And, and, uh, 
we see the, and I've talked about this on the show before, the pro abort seem to be aging and, and not bringing in young people. They're not bringing in young right. people, and we are their worst nightmare. Right, yeah, okay? exactly. So it's, it is very encouraging, and my generation uh, is fed up with the propaganda right. that has been shoved down our throats, and we're also fed up with the apathy of the church. Right. Uh, we've had to bear the burden. It's our brothers and sisters that have been killed through abortion. Right. So we're now rising up saying, okay, we'll do this then if nobody else is going to stand up. And obviously people like you have paved the way for us, pro-life right. leaders that have been involved and it's almost as though you're now preparing us and raising right. us up exactly. to get involved and to be a voice. And it's, it's working. The media is looking at us saying, okay, what do you guys have to say? So again, we were on the O'Reilly Factor, the New York Times, uh, able to get out uh, the pro-life message uh, and, and expose the abortion industry and how horrific it is. And also, an interesting thing, during the Olympics, we found out that the Salt Lake Organizing Committee was going to be distributing condoms to the athletes. Uh, so we were able to expose that and bring out the chastity message and expose the truth that, uh, you know, casual recreational sex with condoms right. is a, a myth and a fairy tale. It's not safe right. uh, ever. So. The most you can uh, say is it's safer. It's safer at the, at yeah, the most. Ex exactly. Uh, right. And actually, you know, but I'm a 25 year old woman, and women are not being taught that the number one sexually transmitted disease is chlamydia, which is not protected with condoms. Right. Okay, and women are very susceptible to that. Sure. So, you know, while we were out in Salt Lake uh, <laughs> demonstrating against the distribution of condoms to athletes, we also found out that the Red Cross and Planned Parenthood had teamed up to distribute flavored condoms and some very, uh, appalling uh, other things uh, in these safe sex kits. They were giving them out on the streets of Salt Lake City during the Olympics to minors. We have confirmed reports of 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, and 14-year-olds getting these kits promoting recreational sex. What does that have to do with the Olympics? Is, is sex an Olympic <clears throat> event now or That's what? what? That was my sound bite. Right. You know, I don't think recreational sex is an Olympic sport. Right. You know, this is diminishing to the games, it's diminishing to the athletes, it's diminishing to, to the people going to the games, it's a slap in the face to the people of Utah. Right. So we actually had a, a great opportunity to meet with the mayor of Salt Lake City. Uh, we also met with some of the uh, leaders, uh, other leaders in Salt Lake City. So it was a very, very successful event for us. Great. Great. I'm glad to hear that. And, yeah. and it's, you know, we have to keep up the pressure. I've always said that what people like Planned Parenthood or the Red Cross want is a nice placid pool where nobody raises a ruckus. And right. our job is to stir the water. Absolutely. We've got to be there on the front lines, even if it's just a few of us. Oh, just We have a to handful. be there. Right. That's another phenomenal thing that has just so touched me. I've only been involved in the, the pro-life movement for about five years, but a handful of people can make such an impact. Absolutely. And a handful of youth can make even right. a bigger impact. And right. so now is the time, it's, it's sink or swim. Right. It is absolutely critical that um, pastors and other uh, people in leadership uh, begin to speak out and educate the youth on this issue. Right. And again, it's the apathy of Christians that has gotten us into the mess that we're in and our generation is having to bear that. Let me ask you something about, uh, we mentioned earlier these polls that show more and more uh, uh, particularly on college campuses where these polls are, are normally taken, more and more people identifying themselves with the pro-life position as opposed to the pro-abortion or pro-choice as they would call it position. Right. One of the things I wonder about is, does that translate into a change in behavior? Uh, it's one thing to say, yeah, I'm philosophically pro-life, mm -hmm. but it's another thing to live a pro-life uh, yes. lifestyle. Does that, do you see any evidence that, that that this actually does? When you change somebody's mind, a, a young person's mind, in college to the pro-life position that that changes the behavior that they might engage in? Yeah, well, we are seeing more than ever in the pro-life movement uh, more uh, youth getting involved. And so it seems to be that that is the case in some areas, and you make a very good point. It's not enough to say you're pro-life. Right. You need to be actively pro-life. It doesn't matter to the child that's being torn apart in the womb that you say you're pro-life. Right. It matters that you're actively involved in preventing abortion. And it doesn't matter to the women that are exploited through the abortion industry either that you say you're pro-life. Yes. That's not enough. It's almost like I'd wish people just didn't even say it right. unless they were exactly. going to be actively involved. Right. You know? So yeah, it seems that uh, as we, uh, as, as uh, this generation is seeing just the propaganda of the abortion industry, that once they say they're pro-life, uh, we now have groups again like Survivors, Rock for Life, Generation Life, all coming together 
uh, to create uh, events in different venues for people to actively be involved, right. which is critical. One of the things that would be really neat, you're, you're mentioning that you do work with these other pro-life yes. organizations. If you guys could see to it that you create relationships that are not based on uh, jealousy or trying to get the upper hand on the other one because there's so much of that in the pro-life movement, so much infighting that really drags us down. Right, and I saw that when I first got involved. Right. I could, I've worked with different ministries and I could just sort of see that and we don't have time for that. Right. You know, right. the, the, our groups were all just, you know, pulling together to get the job done and so th there's no competition. We have no desire to reinvent the wheel. We all right. have our different focuses but we come together for national events and we do a great job. Well, so. that's great. Um, yeah. yeah, that has really, now, the, the good news about that, and, and, I've, and I've tried to make this point on, on previous shows, um, yes, while, we're, while we are uh, plagued with that problem of infighting, uh, and that's human nature to some sure. degree, um, it's much worse on the pro-abortion side. Yes. It doesn't get as much public, you don't see it as much in the, in the public. They, they tend to be people that will say, I hate this person's guts, but I'll go on a news conference so it looks like we're all, right. we're all united. But I can tell you from the infiltration that we do inside the abortion industry, uh, the the level of acrimony that exists between pro-abortion mm -hmm. groups is is palpable and it and it's and it's vicious, much more vicious right. than it is in the pro-life movement. Right. Pro-life movement is more petty than anything else. Right. I think yeah. that still, yeah, in the pro-life movement, all the organizations when they have to come together, they will. They will right. absolutely. And there's just the little petty things. Turf so, battles mostly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, right. it's, and it's human nature, and, right. and you're going to have that. Well, and there's a lot of spiritual attack that goes on when you decide to be actively pro-life. So. Listen, you, you mentioned that, and that's very important. I can tell you that ar around our office, not so much on Life Talk, but even sometimes on, on the prediction of Life Talk, but in the, in, at Life Dynamics when we're doing pro-life activity, the more, we can, you can almost chart it, the more involved we are in something that we know will be very powerful and very devastating to the abortion industry, the more attack we come under. Oh, absolutely. Weird things happen. Oh, well, that's know. just, I mean, right before the Olympics. Everything that could go wrong in my life and also with right. the ministry was going wrong. Right. And I'm driving in my car praying, and I just felt so strongly the Lord saying, good things are about to happen. You right. just hang on. Don't worry about it. Exactly. Right. And look what happened. We did the Olympics. We got on the O'Reilly Factor in New York Times. It was right. just critical that I would stay focused and the exactly. other groups just stay focused. Right. Because, again, we are the abortion industry's worst nightmare and of course, Satan's worst nightmare. Sure. So uh, one and the same. Exactly. Right, right, right. One same person. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so, well, we've got about a minute and a half left. Can you yeah. tell us some of the things that you guys have planned for the immediate yeah, future? Absolutely. We do a number of different uh, national events and, and local events um, in different communities and things. But our our main event that we are so excited about is a pro life rally and cho uh, pro a pro life rally and a pro chastity rally in the spring of 2003 in Washington D.C. And this is going to be a youth rally specifically for youth. This has never been done before and we are expecting a hundred thousand. We've been working very hard. Uh, we have a, another year to go before it's here and we are just so excited to be a voice in Washington DC to bring people out from all over the nation and all over the world. Uh, youth coming out exposing the abortion industry right. okay, and bringing in the message of chastity and just boldly declaring that on a national stage. Right. We believe it's going to make an impact, uh, you know, with the media and also we're hoping that it might wake up the church, right. that Christians would get involved, that they would see the youth out there and they would see our passion and they would realize that their apathy Maybe and their silence. Ashamed. Exactly. <laughs> right. And I say it, I try to say it with respect, as much respect as I can, and with all the love of God in my heart. But there is a certain amount of shaming that is involved. Right. Um, because, again, you know, I'm 25 and I've had to step up. I consider it an honor. You know, I wish I didn't have to, right. uh, but I will do it. And, and again, you know, and part of it is knowing that I want to leave a good legacy. And hopefully the battle will, you know, be short and we will be victorious well, soon. My goal uh, is to make you unnecessary. Right. Okay, I want you know. Right, exactly. I want you to understand that in the right context. No, I, I know exactly what you know, you're I saying. Have an Eleven-year-old daughter. I don't want her fighting this when she's seventy years right. old. Right. You know, right. and the Lord knows how many more uh, tens of millions of dead babies and right. and all the. It, first off, our nation will not survive doing this. God, we are spitting in God's face. He's only going to tolerate this, I think, for a certain length of time. Right. And uh, it's not going to be pretty when the end comes. Right. I often say that. Um, 
you know, when uh, pastors and uh, other lay people and spiritual spiritual advisors are apathetic to abortion, it's a slap in the face to women and to children, Absolutely. obviously. Absolutely. And if it's a slap in the face to women and children, it's a slap in the face to our Lord. Absolutely. So. Well, I want to thank you for coming, and uh, well, we're going to thank gonna, you for having me. We're going to put your uh, information about how people can contact you up on the okay. screen. So, uh, especially for this rally that you're having next year, uh, parents, I think, yes. really need to encourage their children to be involved in yes. that. So. Uh, we'll be bringing people up to date and maybe have you back talk about this, how things are progressing toward that in the future. Thanks for coming. Thank you. We'll be right back. The foundation of all that can be accomplished in the pro-life movement is prayer. Without me, Christ said, you can do nothing. Jesus does not merely help us as if we were working on our own and He came along to ease the burden. Rather, we cannot even begin a good work without His saving action within us. All we do is His gift. We need to pray more and with greater fervor. But be careful not to abuse a good thing. Even prayer can become an excuse, a refuge from our responsibility to take action to stop abortion. The forms of action are many and varied. We are not speaking here of any one kind, but we are all called to some form of action. Why? For the very same reason we are called to pray. Does God really need us to pray? Does He need to be reminded of His duties or told to do His job? Of course not. Yet He calls us to pray because He wants us to be involved in what He is doing. If, therefore, He calls us to pray, even when He could act without our prayers, it is reasonable that He calls us to action even when He could act without our works. God calls us not because He needs us, but because He chooses to use us. Prayer is not just asking God to do something. That's part of it, but it's more. Prayer is union with God. Prayer means we open ourselves so wide to God that He comes in and does something through us. Prayer and action are not two separate options, but rather two aspects of the same reality, union with God. When we come to prayer, we come to the living God, a consuming fire, and the source of all activity. When we come away from prayer, we should not feel rested, but restless. We should not feel that we've done our duty, but that we've been given our duty. Be careful when you ask God to end abortion. His response may very well be to reach down from heaven, lift you up by the back of the neck, and throw you into the battle. God is not going to rip open the sky, come down, and tell our nation to stop abortion. Instead, He's going to put conviction in your heart and words on your lips, and command you to speak and act. Let us never use prayer to escape from action. Instead, let us immerse ourselves in true prayer, which enables us to act in union with God, who destroys death and restores life. I'm Father Frank Pavone for Life Talk. Having an upcoming pro-life event in your area? Add it to our online pro-life calendar. Just submit the details and contact information online at lifedynamics.net or fax them to area code 940-380-8700. Welcome back. We're here with two more representatives of America's new pro-life youth movement. I'm here with Jamie Patterson. Hello, Jamie. How are Hi, you? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? And you're with Rock for Life, as yes, I understand I it, which is um, affiliated with American Life League. Yes, it is. Uh, our friend at Judy Brown at American Life League. Yep. We're happy to have you. And Dan McCullough. Hello, Dan. Hello. And you're with Survivors. I am. As I understand yes. it. And uh, um, I want to ask you a, a real quick question. Sure. I think that the name Survivors is really cool because uh, Tell us what that means, first off. Let's tell sure. the audience what that means. Sure. We use the name Survivors because it's for young people born after the Roe versus Wade decision, 
and therefore everyone involved in our ministry of the younger generation is indeed a survivor of the abortion holocaust and that's where we get our name right you know um uh, when Zentro used to be my co-host here, she had brought that up. She was born after Roe versus Wade, and she had told me that one day, and I had never thought about that, the fact that, you know, she said, I'm a, an abortion survivor. And I said, what do you mean you're an abortion survivor? Well, I was, my, you know, I could have been killed. You know, my life could have been snuffed out before it really ever got a chance to get going. So, and I had never thought about that, and I've often wondered what the emotional impact is on that generation of people who were born after Roe versus Wade. Sure, I think that a lot of us don't even know necessarily all of the ways that it's impacted us, but when we, you simply sit down and think about it, it could have been your brother or sister. Some of us know that it was indeed a brother or sister, a classmate, a would-be friend. So we are indeed survivors. Well, Zentra used to say that when she was in college, she'd look around a college classroom and see empty chairs there. And she said, and I would think about who would be sitting there. Exactly. Who would be sitting in that chair were it not for abortion? Mm -hmm. And what friends would I have that I don't now have if it were not for an abortion? Uh, now, where are you guys located? We are located in Lake Arrowhead, California, just Southern California, um, kind of in the Los Angeles area, just a little outside of Los Angeles, and uh, we're a national group, but that's our headquarters, and we operate from there. Okay. Jamie, what kind of, um, uh, now you guys are located in uh, Stafford, Virginia, yes. right? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. At the headquarters of American Life mm -hmm. League, right? Um, by the way, Judy's going to be on the show later in the year, so Great. We're, we're looking forward to that. That'd be cool. Um, and of course, Eric Winningham from your organization was here one time before. Yeah. Um, what, tell me a little bit about the activities that Rock for Life is involved in. Well, primarily what we do is we communicate our pro-life uh, message through music. Um, and a lot of what we do is we set up individual tables at concerts, um, and we have a great deal of literature and merchandising. Now, these are secular um, concerts. Not... Secular and Christian concerts. We've done um, Lollapalooza when it was still in existence um, in the very beginnings of Rock for Life. Brian and Eric both did Lollapalooza. We've tried to do Lilith Fair, but unfortunately we haven't been able to, so we've done protesting outside and handed out literature there. And Lilith um, Fair is just a, it's just a snake pit of pro aborts. Yeah, right. yeah, and Sarah McLaughlin says she wants it to be an opportunity for everyone to be heard, but she won't let let us be heard so right we see how it is uh, but primarily we do Christian concerts um, and really wherever we can find a table if a promoter or a uh, band says that it's okay we do that uh, we also do protests and rallies outside of clinics um, we participate in the March for Life and we do a tour during the summer great um, have you seen and I, I talked in the in the previous uh, segment with Brandy about this new what appears to me to be a kind of a groundswell of interest in the pro-life issue yeah. among people your age. Um, have, have you seen that? Have you witnessed any anything uh, like that? Yeah, I was involved with Rock for Life in the beginning. I was the uh, second ever chapter head. Um, and now we've expanded to over 90 chapters. And you go to concerts and you see so many kids just excited, just chomping at the bit to want to learn more. They, you're grabbing all of our literature and grabbing our merchandise and wearing them in school. And some of the kids have been wearing them in school photographs. So you can see boldly our message, abortion is mean on a shirt or sweatshirt. And they're not ashamed. And they're proud of that because they know, you know, like Brandy said before, they're just fed up with the lies that we've been being told by Planned Parenthood and MTV and, and by our parents and those types of things that we want to stand up and we want to be counted in some way, shape, or form and we want to be active. So yeah. I've started to see that more so. Um, the, the phenomenon that I talked to Dan about, this, this survivor concept, which I'm pretty fascinated with myself, um, do you see that? Have you, have you noticed that independent of, of his organization, but just among the, the kids that come to you? Yeah. Um, this summer, actually, I spoke with, I counseled a woman, a young woman who had a brother that was aborted, and she was dealing with that and grappling with that and knowing that it was, you know, her mother and father, it was their choice. They, they chose her over her brother. And so there's a whole lot of uh, backlash in that um, and how it's affecting the parental unit. You know, once the kids find out, you know, that they weren't just, chosen they were just chosen you know right. they weren't just uh birthed out of love you know this one was better than this one or something like that there's there's that kind of going on there and you can definitely see that kids uh, campaigning even more saying that i'm doing this for my brother or i'm doing this for my sister or i'm doing this for my niece or nephew that was aborted that so they never knew yeah that they never knew but they right. want a champion for them right um dan one of the things that um i think about in this we, we talked a moment ago about how this impacts your generation your generation is really the first one in American history in which we have told, when I say we, I mean society, not necessarily me, but as a society, we've said to you, you're expendable. You, you are here to serve our needs. You're not a gift, you're a burden. And if we're doing you a favor, if we let you come to life, 
uh, or to, to be born. You're already alive, obviously. You wouldn't, if you weren't alive, there would be nothing to kill. But it, and I've got to believe that has some impact on people when they're told that even their parents can look at them and say, hmm, I wonder if you're really going to fulfill my needs or not, and if not, um, you're going to affect my career. You're not, a, you're not a gift. You're a burden. And I've got to decide whether I want to bear this burden or not. Sure. And I think that that's seen a lot in just how young people have lost the respect for life or, or have devalued life. Our, our whole society has. And we see all kinds of instances of um, shootings at high schools and even middle schools and that sort of thing. And I think that really stems from um, the abortion issue and just where we don't respect life anymore. And that has taught our generation that life is just not nearly as valuable. So. Why should we care about it if our parents didn't care necessarily about our own brothers and sisters possibly? Right. Even? Well, and, and of course, the fact that you guys were born meant that your parents did do that. But just the fact that they had the option is what I'm saying. Right. You know, we said to you, or we, we still say to you, that um, you're expandable. You, you, your, your value is what do you bring to the culture? Are we willing to be burdened with you? Right. And, and children are seen so much as a burden now in our society rather than a blessing and, right. and expendable, as you mentioned. And now we have parts of the United States. Uh, we just saw a, a report from the Bronx in New York, and I know this is true about the Washington, D.C. area, where more children are aborted than are born. Mm -hmm. So half, over half the children that are conceived in those areas are killed rather than being allowed to be born. Yeah, in, in our entire generation, it's actually uh, across the board, across the United States, it's one-third of our generation that has been aborted. So it's, yeah. it's a pretty amazing statistic when you stop and think about it, the millions of children's lives that have been lost. You know, one of the things that I've, I've talked about before, and, and, I, and I think it's really true, if we look at Scripture, Scripture tells us you, you reap what you sow. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting generational issue here. It was not the baby boomers my age who brought us legal abortion. It was the World War II generation. All the Supreme Court justices that, that legalized this and all the people that were fighting for it were from that generation. But then it was our generation which used it. It was the baby boomers who have killed basically 40 million Gen Xers, right? Mm -hmm. And we did that with the permission of our, of our parents, basically because uh, the, the primary reasons given for abortion are you're inconvenient, this is not a good time for you, um, you're too expensive, or you're unhealthy. Now, what's going to happen when in, in a, just a very few short years, baby boomers start retiring, and they retire at the, at the rate of 10,000 a day. Once the first baby boomer starts retiring, 10,000 a day for 18 years. And the Gen X people say, you know, I can't afford to pay for them. There's not enough of me now. 40 million of us are already gone that would have been paying taxes and, mm -hmm. and supporting the, the, gen, the baby boomers. Why aren't the Generation X people at some point going to look at the baby boomers and say, you know what? You're inconvenient, you're unhealthy, and you're too expensive. Absolutely. Isn't it interesting that the same generation that um, really brought about or used at least abortion and, and those reasons to abort their children may be the same generation that suffers at the hand of euthanasia for those same That's reasons. Right. Exactly. Right. And, um, you reap what you sow. It, it's unfortunate, and I, I pray against that, and I pray that that's not what happens. But um, indeed, we're already seeing that euthanasia is becoming a more and more popular thing in this country. It's sad. We already have we already have government money being used to pay for it. Yep. So just like abortion. Right. So again, I, I it, it goes back to this. Just like we said, the, the reap what you sow. We've killed 40 million people because they were inconvenient, too expensive, or unhealthy. We will be inconvenient, too expensive, and unhealthy very shortly. Right. So, and, and we have this kind of upside down pyramid now in our population where there are not enough young people in the workforce to be able to support the, uh, right. your, your generation as they get into that retirement. There's age. hardly a, a business in the Dallas Fort Worth area that you can go into that doesn't have a sign looking for, in the business looking for employees. I mean, sure. it's, it's amazing sure. you know, it, that we have now got into this situation. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that we make abortion policy based on economic considerations. But that's a reality. Right. You know, you can't ignore that as a reality. Um, Jamie, uh, Brandy told me that you guys all work together, and I want to really encourage y'all to, to keep those lines of communications open. And, and I can promise you that it, human nature will be mm -hmm. that you will have conflicts occasionally and butt heads. Um, try to do a better job of it than some of the older <laughs> pro-lifers have done of letting those things be relegated to and have the importance that they deserve, which is basically none. Um, so I want to encourage y'all to do that. 
And I also want to encourage you to keep us posted on the things you're doing because we would like to, to uh, get the word out to people and let them know about your events and so yeah. forth. So be sure and keep us up on that. And uh, maybe we'll look forward to having you guys back on a future show. Great. Thanks for being with us. We Thank really you. appreciate your coming. Thank you for the opportunity. And we will be right back. Life Dynamics seems to have discovered the Achilles heel of the abortion industry. Life Dynamics has been a, a spear carrier here. They collected the correct documents. They made it impossible for the proponents of abortion to deny what was being done. The abortion industry is on a path of self-destruction, and Life Dynamics is ushering it along with an unstoppable strategy. As this crippled industry leans on its crutches of rights and choice, its own failures are eroding away any foothold it has. This red light district of medicine is being exposed and brought to its knees by Life Dynamics medical malpractice campaign that takes abortion doctors and clinics to court for injuring women, sexually assaulting women, and killing women. Life Dynamics' direct mail campaign to the medical community exposes the realities and dangers of performing abortions, ever reducing the number of doctors willing to do them. And as access to abortion decreases, so do the abortions and their abysmal toll on the women who have them. Abortion is a bone stuck in the throat of the American people. Public opinion is shifting. We have the momentum. If you're serious about stopping abortion, be serious about supporting Life Dynamics. We get results, and with your financial support, we will not back down until the last American death camp has been padlocked. Send your tax-deductible donation to Life Dynamics Incorporated, Post Office Box 2226, Denton, Texas, 76202. You can also donate by phone at 1-800-800-LIFE or online at www.lifedynamics.net. Well, that's our show for this month. We're just about out of time, but we've got a couple of, new things, a couple of last things I want to tell you about. First off, since the show began, we've been given some updated news or some uh, breaking news. One of the oldest abortion clinics in Pennsylvania, the Elizabeth Blackwell Health Center for Women, has been closed. This is an abortion mill or a death camp that was open since 1975. Uh, they lost $300,000 last year, and so they've closed the thing down. Well, that is great news. Joining me also on the set for just a few minutes is Flip Benham, my old friend from Dallas. How are you, Flip? Honored to be with you, Mark. My pleasure. Um, we've had a lot of discussions today about the church, and we know that, that you're involved in this issue and trying to get the church off of its cowardly piney and do something about the abortion issue. Uh, tell the folks a little bit about what's going on. Well, Mark, uh, this July 13th through the 21st, Operation Rescue National and Operation Save America are calling the church together here in Dallas, Texas. And we're going to allow the wonderful theology that resides in the church house to become biography in the streets of Dallas. All over at these abortion mills at abortionist homes, we are just going to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the gates of hell. Because we know one thing, and, and you've helped us learn this, Mark, and it's a, a great statement, that, Amer that abortion in America will not come to an end until the Church of Jesus Christ makes up her mind it's going to come to an end and not one second sooner. You're absolutely we, right. We believe it. And so we're going to call the church out into the streets. We're going to have uh, Pastor Sonny Foraker, Pastor uh, Father Pavone is going to be out here with us. And we're going to see that, look, we don't have to wait for the Supreme Court, the president, the legislator. We don't have to wait for anyone. We can simply love our neighbor as ourselves and go out there and live out our faith. And as we do that, God will show up and he'll do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or imagine. Yep. God's going to show up whether we do that or not. It's just, Hallelujah. It's just we don't want him to show up the other way. That's the problem. <laughs> exactly. So let's go ahead and let's be the light of the world. Let's live out our theology in the streets and see what God does. Absolutely. How can people get a hold of you if they want to? Uh, they can uh, find us at operationsaveamerica.org. That's the whole world. A word, operationsaveamerica.org. Or call us at 972-494-5316. Right. Well, we'll be bringing you back on to talk about this a little bit later. Thanks That's for right. coming in. Uh, next month, we're going to be telling you about another exciting new addition to Life Talk, so don't forget to send in your subscription for next month's show. And don't forget your donation to Life Dynamics. Since, life, since September 11th, our donations have dropped off dramatically, and it's really impacting our ability to fight this battle. I obviously understand that you want to help the victims of the terrorist attacks, 
But let's not forget that other terrorists are still at work. They're called abortionists, and they kill more Americans every single day than all the people who died in the September 11th attacks. Like I've told you before, you're the only ones who can make it possible for us to stop this Holocaust. So please don't forget about us. Until next month, remember, Life Dynamics is not here to put up a good fight. We're here to win because winning is how the killing stops. We'll see you in April.